the nature of man we're going to be studying today. We are still going through the sanctuary, but as you know, the sanctuary teaches us the plan of salvation. So for us to know the plan of salvation, we need to be saved from sin. And as we are going to go into, in further studies, the topic of justification and sanctification, we have to get this core teaching down packed correctly, the nature of sin and the nature of man. And we know how sin began. Eve and Adam partook of the fruit in the Garden of Eden. But before they did that, God made a beautiful world for Adam and Eve. Before sin entered the world, as you can see, there are lions and there are giraffes and there is perfect, perfect, perfect creation of God. Adam and Eve were enjoying the works of God's creation. And it was the sixth day which God created Adam and Eve. Genesis 1.31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So now I'm going to share on the sixth day when God created Adam and Eve, how they were made in regards to their character. Steps of Christ, page 9 states, God made man perfectly holy and happy, and the fair earth at it, as it came from the Creator's hand bore no blight of decay or shadow of the curse. What I want us to emphasize is that God made man perfectly holy and happy. Adam and Eve, they are made perfect and they are holy. And of course, they're happy. Page Arts and Prophets, page 49 says, God made man upright. He gave him noble traits of character with no bias towards evil. That significance, no bias towards evil. He endowed him with the high intellectual powers and presented before him the strongest possible inducements to be true to his allegiance. Obedience, perfect and perpetual, was the condition of eternal happiness. On this condition, he was to have access to the tree of life. Now, as we know, after Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, they were no longer granted access to the tree of life. Now, after that beautiful creation, we know sin entered into planet Earth. Genesis 3, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, once sin has taken place, mankind has changed drastically. We saw how God made Adam and Eve. They were holy. They were perfect. They were noble. Now let's see the change which took place. But through disobedience, speaking about Adam, his powers were perverted and selfishness took the place of love. His nature became so weakened through transgression that it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of evil. He was made captive by Satan and would have remained so forever had God not specially interposed. And we see in Romans 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Through sin, his nature is weakened, impossible for him to resist the power of evil in his own strength. And had not God interposed, there would be no help for mankind. But praise God, Genesis 3.15, God placed enmity for mankind. Continuing with Steps of Christ, it is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The carnal mind is enmity against God 
for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Job 14.4, Romans 8.7 Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correct correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God to holiness. So this is the change which all of us must have to be fit for the kingdom. We need a power working from within and from heaven above, God transforming our lives. That power is Christ. So we looked at our condition. That is the condition of mankind. And now we're going to look at the true versus the false gospel. Because Satan is seeking to attack the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Satan does not want anyone to be saved. Satan wants everyone in that lake of fire. Now when you look at our doctrines as a church, pretty much as a whole we are all unified on the topic of the state of the dead. We know that when a person dies they're in the grave and they're awaiting for the resurrection. We on a whole as a church, we are so unified on that and the same with hellfire. But when it comes to the topic of the gospel and salvation, there are so many different heresies and errors being taught. And this is why we must be able to distinguish the true from the false gospel. Now, this diagram here was shared by a presentation done by Elder Dennis Preby showing two trees here. I refer to the tree on the left as the Babylonian tree, Babylon tree, and the tree on the right, I view this as the remnant tree. As we're talking about the nature of sin and the nature of man, you have those, these two trees, and from these trees, a gospel is created. Now, let's start with the tree on the left. Predestination is the root for the tree on the left. Predestination was primarily taught by John Calvin, and God has set who is going to be saved and who is going to be lost. From that root, sin as nature. Therefore, we are born, we have a sinful nature, and that nature is viewed upon as sin. Now, with that root, believing that sin is nature, here comes Babylonians' view of the nature of Christ. Christ took the unfallen nature. Then, through that, we have a sal salvation topic of justification alone. Sanctification is gone. No perfection of character, and therefore, no 1844, no Sabbath, no health, no standards, no law of God, all of these doctrines Babylon does not keep. Now, the tree on the right is actually the correct tree, which starts with free choice. When you think about choice, God is a loving God. God gives his children the choice to serve him or to serve him not. And therefore, when we are born, we are born with a sinful nature because we get this from going back to Adam after he sinned. But we did not choose to get this sinful, fallen nature. Therefore, we are not condemned just for being born. And therefore, Christ coming to save us would have to take the nature which needed to be redeemed, which is the nature whereby we have, which is the fallen nature. And salvation has to do with both justification and sanctification. And with the power of God, we can attain to perfection of character. And therefore, all of our doctrines, the investigative judgment, the spirit of prophecy God has given to the remnant church, the law of God, 
the Sabbath, the health message, and the standards of holy living. Uh, love not the world, love not the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of that can be done through abiding in Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit in the heart. As we're speaking about the nature of sin and the nature of man, you have these two trees. But the sad thing is, even on the tree on the left, there are some among us who believe the tree in the left on the left to be the correct tree and believe in those false teachings. So let's put this clearly together as we are studying. Because as it says in James, if you break one, you are guilty of breaking all, speaking about the Ten Commandments, as a perfect chain, the law of liberty. Now these doctrines are in a perfect chain. The nature of sin, your understanding of the nature of sin will determine your understanding of the nature of man. Your understanding of the nature of man will determine the nature of Christ. And your understanding of the nature of Christ will, will make up your understanding of the atonement which Jesus has done for us. Now as we see this is a perfect chain and it must flow correctly because if you get one part wrong you're going to throw it all off. And we must understand that it is error that divides. It is truth that unites. Never think that truth is a problem. Never be scared to share truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Truth brings God's people together. It is error which divides. Now look at this premise here. Men fall into error by starting with false premises and then bringing everything to bear to prove the error true. In some cases, the first principles have a measure of truth interwoven with the error, just as Satan works. Satan likes to mix truth and error to deceive, but it leads to no just action. And this is why men are misled. They desire to reign and become a power, and in the efforts to justify their principle, their principles, they adopt the methods of Satan. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 181. So this is how it all starts in regards to error. It starts with a false premise and then bringing everything to bear to prove that error to be true. So let's keep going. Now, here we're going to discuss a conversation at, speaking about Desmond Ford. We know Desmond Ford was a teacher in Adventism, but he rejected the sanctuary message, went deep into apostasy, his credentials were removed, and Desmond Ford has really shaken up our church. Now, Colin Standish and his brother Russell Standish and Desmond Ford, they're all from Australia. And this is taken from the book Deceptions of the New Theology by the Standish brothers. It says, in 1978, Colin was speaking with Desmond Ford, Dr. Desmond Ford, the best known proponent of what is now termed the New Theology. Dr. Ford had been inferring that the Adventist message was Roman Catholic. In response, Colin said, you are not honest, Des, to call the Adventist message Roman Catholic. Rather graciously, he responded, Colin, perhaps you are right. I should not make such inferences. Colin responded, Des, this is not what I'm talking about. You know, and I know, but hardly any of those who hear you know that what you are teaching is unadulterated Augustinian Catholicism. The silence that followed indicated that he was not unaware of this fact. So Colin Standish knew that what Desmond Ford was teaching was actually Augustinian Catholicism. And it is from him studying that is how he ended up rejecting the 2300 days. He rejected a day for year principle, rejected righteousness by faith. He preached justification alone, Christ in him 
Christ when he ascended went straight to the most holy place. All of these errors started from him studying Augustinian Catholicism. So the question we need to ask is, who is Augustine? Augustine was born in 320, 354 in North Africa. Augustine also popularized the concept of original sin. Our topic today is the nature of sin and the nature of man. Who popularized the concept of original sin? Augustine. Declaring that man was guilty not only for his, of his own sin, but more importantly, he was guilty of the very sin of Adam. Sin was a state of being, not dependent upon man's desecration of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Though he did suggest that it was evidenced in acts of one's life. So what he is teaching is that original sin, that we are guilty as being born just because we are descendants of Adam and our nature, which is sin, he believes is continually condemning you. Augustine view of original sin created a dilemma. Now we're going to see how everything from one false premise, everything else, the error will continue. Augustine's view of original sin created a dilemma when he considered the incarnate Christ. If we were sinners just because we were born, then this would infer that Christ too was a sinner, for he too was born as we are. Of course, this was an intolerable thought. The Bible plainly described Christ as that holy thing that was born of thee, born of Mary. Luke 135, Christ could never be described as sinful. Therefore, Augustine was forced to conclude logically that Christ possessed an altogether different nature from man. Thus, he postulated that Christ possessed the nature of unfallen man. In this, he ignored the plainest evidence of Scripture to the contrary, because the Scripture plainly teaches that Christ took our fallen nature. But you see how he came to that conclusion. If mankind has a fallen, is mankind, his nature, he believe in original sin, is constantly condemning him, Jesus cannot have the same nature that we have, or else he would be a sinner. So now he has, now has to deal with Christ now, coming now to get Mary. He has to have something to change up in regards to Mary. He has a problem now. So since Christ was declared to have the human nature of an unfallen man, that was his conclusion, this led the Catholic Church to espouse the blasphemous doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which was fully incorporated into church dogma in the 19th century. This doctrine declared that Mary was born of the Holy Ghost so that she could have a son who possessed an unfallen nature. Thus, step by logical step, Augustine's false theory led to the incorporation of numerous unscriptural doctrines receiving ex acceptance by the Catholic Church. And from the Catholic Church, it spread to the daughters. And even some, even among us, because those, when Desmond Ford brought all of his error, some people actually was following him because they liked how he spoke and they were following Desmond Ford. But even though he was separated from the church, those who followed him stayed in the church and they were actually continually preaching his error in regards to righteousness by faith as he taught it incorrectly. So now, because Mary, we have a problem because Mary is going to give birth to Jesus now. Here comes the Immaculate Conception. But we have a problem because guess what? Mary had a mother. So then from Mary's mother, Mary would have a fallen nature. So you see, it makes no sense. But when you have a false premise at the beginning, you're trying to put error upon error to fix. And it keeps on continuing. So now as we see the error that Desmond Ford got caught up into. Now let's look at what is the truth. What does the Bible teach about mankind? 
Well, the Bible teaches sin is not inherited. We do not get guilt from Adam as was taught by Augustine. Man is responsible for his own sin. This is speaking about in Exodus 32, the situation with the golden calf. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever sinneth against me, him will I blot out of my book. Moses, I'm not going to do this to you. Those people who were dancing there with the idolatry of the golden calf, these are the ones who are responsible because they did the sin. Moses, you did not do any sin, so you will not be responsible for their sin. Ezekiel 18 verse 20, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Very clear. The parents cannot pass down to their children their iniquity. And Romans 5 verse 12 shows very clearly, Wherefore, as by one man, speaking about Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So therefore, we are all mortal. Because we can't eat from the tree of life, we have this fallen nature, the wages of sin is death. And so death passed upon all men. Why? For that all have sinned. We all have sinned. We are all mortal. We are subject to death. But we are not condemned or do not receive guilt because Adam sinned. Adam will be judged for the way he lived his life. But when we look at the second commandment, there is something that can be passed down from parents to children. Now let's learn what that is. This is taken from Patriarchs and Prophets. Speaking about quoting from the end of the second commandment. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Ellen White states, It is inevitable that children shall suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing, but they are not punished for the parents guilt how will they be punished except as they participate in their sins it is usually the case however that children walk in the steps of their parents by inheritance and example the sons become partakers of the father's sin notice there example they follow their parents example and many times they do the same sins that their parents did. Wrong tendencies, perverted appetites, and debased morals, as well as physical disease and degeneracy, are transmitted as a legacy from father to son to the third and fourth generation. This fearful truer, truth should have a solemn power to restrain men from following a course of sin. And if you've read Adventist Home, speaking about the mother when she is pregnant and ministry of healing that a mother should carefully guard her diet because what she does what she eats the stresses she's upon will affect the baby growing in the womb so if the mother smokes the mother drinks alcohol that is going to affect the health of the baby and the baby born can have very much health problems because of the mother. So these things are passed down as the baby's in the womb, but also hereditary tendencies are passed down. But we are only guilty if we do the sin which our parents did, then we will be guilty. So it's it's been said genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So if a person has the father was alcoholic, the son may be predisposition is first drink, second drink, boom, he could become an alcohol quick. But guess what? If the son never drinks alcohol, he will not be an alcoholic. So therefore, we have choices, and by our choices, we can choose to follow our parents' example, or we can choose to not follow. Speaking here about an example that is wrong. Now, our sinful nature that we have 
which we did not choose, does not condemn us. Education, page 29, states, There is in his nature, speaking about us, mankind, there is in his nature a bent to evil, a force which unaided he cannot resist. That's just like we read in Steps of Christ. To withstand this force, to attain that ideal, which in his inmost soul he accepts as alone worthy, he can find help in but one power. That power is Christ. Cooperation with that power is man's greatest need. So when we are born, we have this bent towards evil. It's easier to do wrong than to do right. With children, because it said selfishness took the place of love. So therefore, we usually with little kids, we don't say, don't stop sharing everything. Well, little kids, what do they mostly say? Mine, that's mine, that's mine. So all of this is because of sin. We have this bent towards evil. But this is why we all need Christ. And this is why Jesus said, John chapter 3, we all must be born again. We did not choose our sinful nature. We were born with it. But there is good news for us. Through Christ, we can be partakers of the divine nature. Therefore, to make this crystal clear, a newborn baby is not born condemned. That baby has no guilt and this is the reason why we do not do infant baptism because the Bible says those who are baptized need to be taught. A baby, a newborn baby, all the baby does is cry when it needs to be changed, cries when it's hungry. What else can the baby do? So therefore the baby is not born with guilt. The baby is not born condemned. That baby is born innocent in God's sight. But as I stated, even though we have this bent towards evil, praise God for the gospel. Peter says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We can be partakers of the divine nature by being born again with even with our fallen nature, we can live, give, live lives that are pleasing in the sight of God. Sin is indeed a choice and victory is possible. Let no one say, I cannot remedy the, my defects of character. If you come to this conclusion, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. It says in Steps to Christ and also in Thoughts for a Model of Blessing and also in Desire of Ages that the greatest battle to be fought is the battle to the surrender of self. That is our greatest struggle, to surrender all will require a great struggle, but the soul must submit to be renewed into holiness. So that surrender is what we all must do. Surrender. And then by God's grace, we can keep his holy law. So sin is indeed a choice. And because God is good, God seeks to bring light because he does not want us to be in, a, be in darkness. And this is why we do evangelism, because people are in darkness of error and we need to give them light and the truth as is found in Jesus. So John 15 verses 22 and 24, speaking about the time of Christ, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin because Jesus declared the truth to them. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. Continuing, John again. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, 
are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now, God is truly fear. The Bible says, And in times of this ignorance, when we didn't know, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. And this is how people who lived during the Dark Ages, where the Bibles were not even in the language of most people, where people did not have all the truth that we have now in regards to health reform, in regards to even the Sabbath, and they were under papal tyranny. They lived up to the light in which they have, and we know that many of them will be in the kingdom. Because they did not have full access to the Word of God, in this time of ignorance, God winked at them. But if they lived up to the light in which they had, God will save them. And we see that also in Romans, those who do not have the written word, those the Holy Spirit speaks to their conscience. And as they live a life as pleasing to God by following as the conscience leads them, they also can be saved. Just remember that Jesus is doing all he can to save mankind. Jesus is trying to save all and he's doing everything possible so that we can be saved. He does not want his children to be lost. Our God is love. So now God brings light. But if we reject that light, here comes the condemnation. We shall not be held accountable for the light that has not reached our perception, but for that which we have resisted and refused. A man could not apprehend the truth which had never been presented to him, and therefore could not be condemned for light he had never had. This is how God is fear. If this person did not know this truth, they will not be condemned because they did not have that light. But if light come and that light is set aside or rejected, then comes condemnation and the frown of God. But before the light comes, there is no sin, for there is no light for them to reject. Now back to the tree here. We've seen that the two trees, the trees on the left, dealing with sin as nature, as Augustine taught. So therefore, because of that he taught that, he came up with Christ having to take an unfallen nature, and therefore Immaculate Conception comes because what are we going to do with Mary? And then all of this stems from that. And sadly, even among us, some are partaking from that tree on the left. We need to ask ourselves, which tree are we going to base our theology? Are we going to base it on a Catholic tree? Or are we going to base it on the remnant tree, which has the present truth? Our sinful nature does not condemn us. We need Jesus. We need to abide in Jesus moment by moment. We need to be abiding in Christ, John chapter 15, so that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Sin, which carries guilt and condemnation, is the willful, the knownful violation of the law of God. Now, if you really think about it, as we've been studying the sanctuary, if we were to look at the tree on the left, and if we were to believe that our sinful nature, we are guilty, and condemned just for having a sinful nature, what would the people have to have done in the Old Testament? Every second of every day, they would have to be killing and killing and killing lambs because every second they would be sinning. Just by breathing, you would be sinning because your nature is condemning you. And with that theology, it gets even worse when you look at end-time eschatology. So let's break this down. The nature of man and the nature of sin. Biblical truths on the left, the new theology on the right. Man is born with evil tendencies that bent towards sin. The new theology teaches man is born with original sin. That's Augustinian Catholicism right there. 
being taught, man chooses his eternal destiny. Choose ye this day whom you shall serve. New theology teaches that man's eternity is predestined. That's that tree on the left with predestination. Biblical truth teaches that there are conditions to salvation. What's a condition? We must repent. What's a condition? We must confess our sins. What's a condition? We must be baptized. What's a condition? We must obey the Ten Commandments. These are conditions to salvation. New theology teaches once saved, always saved. And justification is just a huge umbrella always covering you. And once you accept Jesus, even if you say I accepted Jesus 20 years ago, that covering of justification always covers you. And they have this belief, once saved, always saved. Biblical truth teaches that saints can have victory now. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. New theology teaches that saints will continue to sin until Jesus returns. I've heard that taught in Adventism. Biblical truth is the new birth takes place at conversion. New theology teaches that the new birth takes place after conversion. Now, let's look at the nature of sin. Biblical truth is that sin, the Bible definition is sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is volitional disobedience. New theology teaches that sin results from human limitations, basically because we have this sinful fall in nature. All sin must be put away now. This is the teaching of the sanctuary, so that our sins can be blotted out. New theology teaches that sin is removed at the second coming, because they believe that our nature is sin, so therefore we're going to be continually sinning, and we can only be separated from sin when this mortal shall put on immortality at when we have the new bodies. The biblical truth says that one sin separates from Christ. New theology teaches that we are not separated from God if the tenor of our life is right. So they look at the trajectory of the whole life. Well, for the majority of his life, he was doing okay, so therefore he is heaven bound even if he's in violation of the law of God. As we look at this, God's people now, as we are studying the sanctuary, there is to be a cleansing of the people on earth. And when we look at the example of Moses, that when Moses struck that rock, when he was to speak to the rock, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 11 and 12, Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land. And then Joshua led them in. And we know that it is just by Adam and Eve partaking of the fruits, whereby that one sin, here we are with the fallen nature, wages of sin is death, and here the whole mankind has been affected because of sin. One sin there. The Bible teaches in Isaiah 59 verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It is sin which separates us from God. God is always pleading with us to repent, and God wants to save us all, but God cannot have sin happening again. Affliction shall not arise a second time. So all we can take to heaven is the character which we form on earth, and those souls that we have won, by cooperating with the Holy Spirit and leading souls to Christ. That's all we can take to heaven. Sin is the problem and sin is what needs to be separated from God's people and sin is what God wants to blot out as his role as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So today we just looked at briefly the topic of the nature of man and the nature of sin. And just showing those two trees whereby two different Gospels are being taught in the world. And some of these heresies has even come in among us. So just sharing this so that we can be solid in regards to what is the truth in regards to the nature of man and the nature of sin. So let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I am so thankful that you are 
so loving towards us. You've given us choice, you've given us free will, and you have done all that you can so that light can come to us. And with this tremendous responsibility of having all of this light, we have the duty to share it with others. So I pray that you would give us that love for souls so that this truth that we know, we will not keep it to ourselves, but we will share it with a dying world. It is our desire that you would so transform our hearts so that we will be fit for the kingdom. Help us for the trying times ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.